We've been on a kick. Anybody want to tell me where we've been at? Following. Following Jesus, but under what? Christian atheism. So today we're talking about counterfeit. So anybody could tell me what does it mean, counterfeit? To be fake. To be fake. What else? Can you give me the, the dictionary be meaning? Authentic. Authentic. Anybody Imitation. else? Imitation. Imitation. Anybody else? It doesn't have the quality of the original thing. Okay. All right. And what does original mean? A resemblance. A resemblance of the original. Yeah. That's that's counterfeit, right? Yeah. Okay. How about original? Like the first of its kind. First of its kind. Anybody else? Real. Real. Anybody else? Authentic. Authentic. I like that. All right. So tonight we're talking about counterfeit or original. Anybody have an experience with buying something you thought was real and it ended up being fake? <laughs> Anybody have have a a story? I can have a recent story. My, so my daughter, I didn't even notice that. So I bought on Amazon these earrings. It says 14 carats. So I'm like, oh, you know, this is real and it's cheap. Like, I'm in there. As I put it on, she's been with them for like two weeks, especially like her whole year. Ooh. And then as I'm reading the the actual, like, you know, because I'm about to call somebody. I'm like, who do I have to call to figure out, like, why to say, you know, 14 mm -hmm. Um, And it actually, in the description, it says dipped in. Ooh, so, I like that. All right, so all right. Okay, anybody else got a, an experience where you, you bought something you... I was about 16 years old and I was in I was in the mall and a guy comes up to me he's like yo I got this chain for sale bro I'm like how much you want he was like how much you got on me I mean I got 20 bucks man he's like oh, you got 50 I'm like I got 20 bucks he's like ah give me that 20 dollars I take the chain give him the 20 dollars I'm here rocking this gold chain thinking it's so official. But you know, like, but how do we know when something is counterfeit? Well, if it's if it's jewelry, it's gonna turn brown, it's gonna get infected. How about something else? Like, how do you know when something's counterfeit? Like, for example, sneakers or clothes. Deflated? <laughs> so today's gut check. And for those of you who don't who, who don't know, a gut check isn't for and is not to make anybody feel bad. It's not to embarrass anybody. It's literally what it is. It's a gut check. It's a question that I'm asking you. Um, not for you to answer to the group, but for you to think about what the answer is. Hopefully by the end of the class your answer is different than what it was in the beginning. So today's gut check is, are we counterfeit Christians or are we what God created us to be? When we say counterfeit Christians, we're talking about not necessarily, um, we're talking about, how do I word this? We're talking about people who know who Christ is, come to church, they play the part, and then they do their thing on the side knowingly. Now, there's Christians that are babies in Christ that are walking this path, and God is starting to remove certain things. I wouldn't call that a fake Christian because God is working. I'm talking about seasoned Christians that know and are still playing the part. They're still doing, um, you know, they know the word, and they still, yes. something like that. I, like, I don't want to name people because remember, this is, a, a gut check, right? This is a gut check. Only I can't say, Jasmine, you're a counterfeit Christian because I'm not in Jasmine's shoes, right? 
I can only say if Lucindy's a counterfeit chi- Christian, not a chicken, Christian. <laughs> um, because I know my daily walk, okay? So I don't want to say, sit here and say, Cynthia, you're a counterfeit Christian. I, can't, I don't have the right to say that. Only you have the right to say that about yourself. Does that make sense? That's why it's a gut check. Are you a counterfeit? Or are you um, what God created you to be? No, but I'm saying not calling people that, but just knowing. That they are? Knowing that, they, like, so, I guess it's more of a personal. Yeah, it is, it is. Um, so when I say counterfeit Christian, or are you what God called you to be, I, I, I guess what I'm asking you is, God told you to be this or to do this, called you to do this, and you're not doing it. You're doing something else. Do even though you know. Even though you know. Do you guys? So, so we can call a counterfeit Christian a person that's lukewarm. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. So that, I would call a counterfeit Christian a lukewarm person. A yeah. person that yeah. neither in Christ, that's in Christ or, or in the world. Yeah. You know, because... When you're a, when you are a uh, lukewarm person, you know what you're doing. Knowingly, that's mm, the. That's the I think that's the key word. Um, there there was once a story about a dude, right? That he he was a, a a leader, and he you know he knew the word of God, but he used it to his advantage. So he's like, I'm gonna do what I could do, and then I'm gonna go and say sorry to the Lord because. Grace, the Lord's grace is infinite. Now, I would consider that a counterfeit Christian because you are you are twisting the word knowingly. You're sharing your erroneous beliefs to those that don't really know and making them believe that that is the right way when you know that that is absolutely wrong. So he's using it on his benefit. Right. That's what I would consider. So yes, a lukewarm Christian. So. Um, again, that's not for anybody to answer. That's not for me to call you or you to call me. That is a very personal thing. The whole point of these classes is God has been getting in our face about our personal stuff, not about the obvious stuff, about the stuff that we don't talk to about other people, talk to with other people. God is talking about I'm, and you're in the hot seat, Jennifer, so I'm just going to look at you. God is, because you're like right across from me, God is, is, only you know what you deal with, right? Your struggles. So God is getting in your face about it as he's getting in mine. I'm talking about things we don't discuss with other people. That's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. So um, I'm going to read this to y'all. Since the beginning of time, there's always been people who make counterfeits of the original. The original always costs more money with the counterfeit brought at a fraction of the price. But the counterfeit usually has a drawback. We spoke about that. It, is, it isn't made as well. It doesn't last as long, and sometimes it doesn't work at all, okay? Um, on MSN.com this morning, there's an Apple store in China, and it's not a fruit store. It's an actual Apple store. They were posing as an Apple store, okay? So they look like the Apple products. It looked like the Apple store. It had the classic Apple store winding staircase and weird upstairs sitting area just like the Apple store. The employees were even wearing blue t-shirts with the chunky Apple name tags around their necks. But upon closer, listen to this, upon closer inspection, our intrepid fellow American realized a beautiful ripoff, a brilliant one, the best ripoff store we've ever seen. But some things were just not right. Pay attention. When it's imitation, it's a copycat, there's always gonna be something off. And if you're not paying attention, you won't catch it. Just like the 14 karat gold earrings that Jasmine brought, they were not lying, but they also wrote in the description, dipped in karat gold. She didn't read that. We don't read the fine prints. We look at the bigger thing. Oh, it looks, so it must be. And yet, in the description, so what can you possibly say to them? Oh. You gave me fake earrings. They're going to go back to you and be like, in the description, it says dipped in 14 karat gold. Okay. That's the, that's the little thing that the enemy does. He'll tell us the big picture, but we never read the fine print. Or how many of you, when you buy something, do you actually sit there and read the 51 pages that they give you with the fine print? Or you just sign off, sign off, sign off. They do that on purpose. Of course they do. 
So listen to this. It says the walls hadn't been painted properly. Apple never writes Apple Store on its signs. But here's the real kicker. Some of the staff appeared to believe they were really working for Apple. The original always costs more and may be tough to acquire. So you got people in China working for the Apple Store and they didn't even know it was not the Apple Store. Like they were here like, yeah, I work for Apple. You're not working for Apple. Like that's invitation. Like how bad is that? Like I'm working at McDonald's now, bro. That's not McDonald's. That's McDonald's. <laughs> that's McDonald's. <laughs> It's like when you try a phone that is imitation, it's not gonna last. Only the original will last for this. But that's the thing. That's why, and it, it brings me back to Jasmine with her trading. She says trading requires patience, and I think that as believers, we're quick to jump into things because we don't got the patience to read the fine print. Um, and the enemy takes advantage of that because we're living in a society where I want it and I want it now. And it doesn't matter at what cost. Here's the thing. Time will always, and we spoke about this last week, time will always expose the truth. Eventually. Eventually the truth will always come out. If somebody's a con and you watch them, eventually Something is not going to click and you're going to be like, ah, I knew there was something off about you. Couldn't put my finger on it. So look what it says. The enemy has always been a counterfeit. He's a copycat and always wanted to take God's glory. And um, I've been watching a lot of YouTube videos lately of like the witches and all this and that. And one guy, the guy that you were talking to me about, Jennifer, uh, uh, Jose, what, this guy. John Ramirez, he was saying that just how the church has like hierarchies and apostles and worship teams and all this and that, the enemy also, he does, uh, he has the same thing. He has worship leaders. It's counterfeit. Like the enemy has always wanted to copy. To get to that position is exactly how the worst thing works. You don't know how they went to be a leader. They don't know what they always have to cost for. It's so yes. a cost to be for another level. Like you have to do some sacrifice to be in that. Or I want to be a priest, you have to kill all these people. There's, it's there's, it's so the just how we have the hierarchy in the Christian kingdom, it's the same thing in the in the kingdom of darkness. But today we're going to talk about Genesis chapter thir um, chapter three. If somebody can can go to it, let's go to it. Genesis chapter three. I'm going to tell you what verse. Because here's the thing, and we've spoken about this before. In every truth, in every lie, there's a hint of truth. A lie isn't just a lie. Because if it was a blatant out lie, we wouldn't believe it. There's got to be some sort of truth there. Right? So let's go to truth. Um, no, let's go to uh, Genesis chapter 3, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the snake was the most clever of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. The snake spoke to the woman and said, Woman, did God really tell you that you must not eat from the, any tree in the garden? The woman answered the snake, No, we can eat the trees in the garden but there is one tree we must not eat from god told us you must not eat fruit from that tree that is in the middle of the garden you must not even touch that tree or you will die so four also yeah but the snake said to the woman you will not die so i mean what was the first mistake there El primer problema ahí. What was the first problem that we see in, in those verses? Why do you even start a conversation? Why do we even start a conversation? Um, that, that mistake that Adam and Eve made in Genesis 3 is the same mistake we tend to make. We in, they entertained the thought and began to question what God has said. God said it. And yet here comes the enemy and he's, He's, is he saying exactly right? He's like, well, he says, uh, did God really say? 
How many times has the enemy done that with us? Like God will say, don't do this. And the enemy said, well, did God really say that? It says, the arrogance in the serpent may have looked like confidence to Adam and Eve so much that they overlooked the fact that he didn't have the authority to define truth. Only God does. How does he do that with us? He will make us believe that happiness is what's important. He will always try to discredit God. It's only when we manage to quiet the Christian atheist in us and seek God and his kingdom over the empty and hollow things of this world that we can experience true and la lasting blessing. But I'm going to ask you all something. What is the formula that this world says that there's happiness? Living your best life. Money. Money. Living your best life. What else? What does social media tell us that if you... Party. Party. What else? Come on, Jolie. You're smirking at me. What, is, what does social media tell us? What is the... What is the Truck. Do what feels right. The best body. Get skinny. That's I hate you, devil. Go ahead. <laughs> Vaping. Uh huh. Oh, fame. Uh huh. Sex. Sex. Basically, power. do what feels right. Power. Feel power. Love, lust, and lies. Love, lust, and lies. But so here's the thing. Here's what the world tells us is the formula for happiness. Better possessions, right? If you have a better car, you'll be happy. Peaceful circumstances, thrilling experiences, go on vacation. You need a vacation. You ever seen that meme that says, they said I won't be happy. And then they see the guys um, dancing in like Aruba. He's like, I feel pretty happy here. Um, the right relationships, right? Social media is always throwing that. If you find the right man, you're going to be happy. If you find the right girl, you're going to be happy. Um, the perfect appearance. I mean, how many do we see that all over social media? If you get this surgery, if you do this, if you remove that, if you use this, you'll be happy. Um, and here's the truth. I mean, here's the question. Are they lying? You'll be happy for a little bit. I mean, yeah. Right. So they're not lying. If you take me to Aruba, I'm going to be happy. Debt, okay, <laughs> debt free. If you if you're debt free, you'll be happy. But it, attention, you no, but because there is truth to that. If you have the perfect husband, you're gonna be happy. Except that the perfect husband doesn't exist, and the perfect wife doesn't exist, and the perfect house doesn't exist, and the perfect body doesn't exist. Like yes. <laughs> but but even that can be counted as void because if happiness if money was the equivalent of happiness then why do rich people kill themselves so then uh, that automatically dismisses the claim that money fixes everything because we've seen plenty of rich people are miserable if you have the perfect body you'll be happy then how come my girl JLo can't stay in a relationship I mean she has a beautiful body Right. right, but here's the thing, they are happy, and, the, and that's the thing, remember that the enemy will always use truth when he lies to us, he's not lying to you Mara, so when he says if you find the perfect man you're going to be happy, yeah, happy is temporary, I'm happy when I eat a plate of food and then I get hungry again, and I get cranky again, um, there was a book that I'm reading and Madonna said, she says, I am, I go to one level and I, I feel good when I'm at that level. And I guess my work ethic is that I never stop, but she's chasing something that she'll never be able to achieve. There's a void within us, right? That we're going to continue chasing. And, and we think that if we reach that, then we'll be happy. That's the lie that the enemy tells us. That's the, that's, the, that's the lie that the world tells us, that if you reach this, if you have your kids all in the right order, if they're not doing A, B, C, you know, if you have the perfect man, if you have the perfect house, if you have, and some people actually achieve that, and yet they still are not happy. Many of us live as if we honestly believe this phony formula. Now, let me ask y'all, 
how many of us have actually believed that formula? I mean, I look at it like this, and you know, to make it easy to, to understand, I'm a sneaker guy. I, I love, I love sneakers. So anytime a sneaker drops, I want those sneakers. I want those sneakers. I finally get the sneakers, and I'm hyped for a second, and then okay, para la colección. And then if I wear them once or twice, I just gotta find the right fit. Then it's just about finding the right fit, and it'll just sit there and sit there and sit there and sit there. To so some of the points that sometimes I even forget that I even have them, and, and then I bring out a pair of sneakers, and my son is like, "Are those new?" I'm like, "No." I'm like, I've never seen them before. I'm like, they've been there. I just don't use them. So it's like what you're saying, that temporary happiness. It's like, you know, but I don't know. It's, it's a placebo effect. Our culture has conditioned us to believe that things we don't have are the things that make us happy. Never mind that many of those things didn't even exist. Not, not, none of those things existed five years ago. We blindly chase whatever is newer shinier and faster we crave peaceful circumstances for example if we don't like a job a boss a salary a co-worker we cut them but here's the thing i'm gonna quit my job because i don't like them and you go to the next job i'm gonna quit my job because i don't like them you notice a pattern here you're the problem i'm gonna leave habit straw because i'm miserable on habit straw mommy wherever you go there you are there you are. And, and a lot of times it's hard for us to actually acknowledge that. If I find a new husband, maybe I'll be happy. And then you get into the next marriage and you got the same problems. And you're like, damn, this must be not the right one. Let me try somebody else. And then you see the same person in somebody else. And it's like, why do I keep reliving the same relationship? Maybe it's not the dude. Maybe it's you. Okay. Or friendships. You have the same problem with every single friend. Then maybe... You're the problem. Because miserable people make other people miserable. Misery loves company. And I know, guys, that it's very hard to actually acknowledge that there might be something wrong with us. I mean, God forbid that we actually look at ourselves. Um, but that's human nature. In a college class, if it's too difficult, then we quit. And so we're always moving on to the same thing and moving on and moving on. So then, if the enemy is offering us this, how do we, what, what are you saying, Lou, that, you, that God doesn't want us to be happy? Actually, that's exactly what I'm saying. What? I was actually going to call the class that, but then I was like, these people on Instagram are going to think that she really lost her mind. But if God has to break your heart to save your life, he'll do it. Because his, his goal is eternity. We're only aliens in this world. So if it means that he has to take everything away from you to take your, to get and grab your attention to save your soul, then sometimes that's what we have to go through. And he because will break you to remake he, you. He, he will, yes, that sounds, no, we are aliens. Yes, we are. We don't belong to this world. We're not from this world. That's why. <laughs> an alien Same child difference. of God. Same difference. Um, and you Puerto Rican girl, you're definitely an alien. <laughs> Listen, I think that we forget that. That we're only here visiting. That our goal isn't the goal of other people to make it big in this world because this world isn't our home. The goal is to make it to heaven. And sometimes we ask God, why have you allowed this to happen? But the truth is that if God didn't take everything away from us, we're so self-absorbed that we would never seek him. That sounds so cruel. When I was studying this class, it sounds so cruel that the God that we serve doesn't want us to be happy, but he doesn't want us to be happy because happy is temporary. He wants us to be joyful. He wants us to experience something that's, that no one can take away. There was a story about people who were at a funeral and they never felt more joy. And it sounds morbid because how can you feel so much joy at a funeral? Because they knew that the person that had died was going to heaven and that nothing in this world can move them. God is trying to fill us with joy so that when the things of this world, our world gets rocked upside down, 
we're not moved because our joy doesn't come from the things we see, but the things we don't see, it comes from above. Am I making sense? Yes. I wanted to mention something. I think that sometimes God will allow us to be through things so that we can give him glory, right? So, for instance, yesterday, like, I have, like, no cash until I get paid, right? Usually they do food shopping, but my manager has gone food shopping. So I'm like, I'm starving. I was so hungry that I was nauseous. That's how hungry I was on my head. I'm like, oh, Lord. And I was just there, like, talking to God, like, I'm so hungry, I don't know what that can I do, whatever. So as I'm going to the bathroom, a rep comes. Uh, a rep is a, a big person that sells uh, farms of the drug. And she comes in with a platter of fruits. And I'm like, oh my God, don't wear my hat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to eat the bathroom until I'm full, right? So as I'm eating the food, thank you, you know, that even if it was fruits, you know, you provide it, you know? So I'm eating the fruits and I'm getting full and then all of a sudden a pastry comes in and he's like, he comes in with a piece of ours. And he's like, oh, this is for, this is for you guys. And I'm just like, what are you doing? And I'm like, thank you. Like, you see, that, that right there, like, I, there's no, who else am I going to give the glory to? Right? right? Because if I'm talking to God directly, and all of a sudden, boom, I, I kind of pushed it a little. I was like, this is what I grew to. And I asked him for more. But the truth is that I had to give him the glory. And I said it in front of everyone in the office. I'm like, God is good. Look, like, and even they saw it. They're like, God is good. Like, we didn't have anything to eat. And now we have all this food, you know, but that's to show up and to trust him. So, and, and what I'm saying is, for God's glory, you know what I mean? Sometimes God has to take away from us because we tend to forget who's the one that's providing for us. Because, yes, we work, but why? who gave us a job? Who's the one that gives us help? Who's the one that gives us energy? Who gives us God? It's all God. I, um... So one of my clients, you know, uh, Michela knows, last week I asked for prayer for one of my clients. Her mom, her dad had died about a year and a half ago, a sudden death. Now her mom was diagnosed with cancer in January. And this is how you know that they're believers beyond believers because she, she was diagnosed with cancer. It was terminal. They gave her chemo. She was good. They checked her again. Chemo, uh, cancer spread. Long story short, they put her on hospice. And the girl was like, you know, my mom is dying and she was sounding so calm. And I was just like, yo, like she's not bugging out and she's pregnant. So I'm like, why is she not bugging out? And she goes, but for us to die is to live. And I was just like, my girl was like, she said it just like that. She was like, for us to die is to live and to see my mom suffering and living a life that's not a life. It's, there's no quality. I'd rather her die. And that sounds cruel, but I know that she wants to go back to her heavenly father. So long story short, the grandma, the mom ended up dying. She texted me. She goes, Lucy, my mom died, but not, I know she's in heaven with the Lord now. She was so at peace with it. I think that's the level that we should all get to where not being okay with death, but being okay with the fact that our world has been rocked upside down, but knowing that the one that created you has never left you nor forsake you. And I have a question. Is there anybody here that knows that you know that you know that regardless what you've been through, you know that God has never left you Amen. nor forsaken you. Amen. That you should have been dead. And if not dead, you should it be here sitting today? Yeah. I wonder if there's anybody. Because when you start thinking of life like that, your praise changes. Yeah. Your worship changes. You know that you don't deserve to be here. And yet he has allowed you to live another day. So then the question would be, the enemy has played me all these years, making me believe this lie, this counterfeit lie 
making me believe that the things of this world, that I belong to this world, that I'm not anybody. And yet this whole time, I'm gold. I'm precious gold. I mean, does anybody get what I'm saying? That you felt so bad about yourself this whole time because of the life that you've lived. You've told God it's not fair. You've asked God, why? Why did that happen? Why did this happen? And then all of a sudden you have an epiphany and you're like, oh, shoot. I'm actually special. I, I thought I was born by accident. I thought... I thought that I was born into this family by accident. And then you realize your value through the eyes of Christ. And all of a sudden, your world that you thought was so dark, all of a sudden, the blinders come off and you're like, oh, I'm a miracle. I'm wondering if there's anybody here that can say that. Amen. Right. Um, um, so, so, you know, one of my cousins had just passed. Mm -hmm. um, but his mom... Like, I've been calling her, and I'm like, how are you doing? She's like, her son was got into an accident, and he's been on life support, so they just pulled the plug the other day. So I had um, went to the hospital to go see, to go, you know, say her, like, last goodbye. <coughs> and I call her, and she's like, yeah, I'm making eggs, <coughs> and I'm doing this, and I'm like, oh, she's like, I'm, she's like, I'm making eggs, and I'm doing all these things, and I'm like, what? She's like, oh yeah, I'm about to take a nap, and but you know they're gonna. Her son was brain dead after the accident, so they were pulling the plug, and I was like, oh, are you gonna come back to the hospital? She's like, yeah, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna take a nap, and but she was like, I'm not worried. God took my son, but I know the God that I serve, and I know that God is faithful even through all of this, mm. and I'm not even gonna question God. And then I got off the phone and I started crying. And I was like, this woman's son is laying with a machine right now. That She has to come back to talk to the doctors. They have to make a decision. Are they going to let him live to see if God is going to save him? Or are they going to pull the plug? When you're brain dead, you honestly know that, like, there's probably no coming back from that. But um, I had called her and I was like, what were you doing? She's like, oh, you know, I'm going to just take a shower. I'm going to go to the hospital a little bit. I'm going to get the kids together. You know, our kids are older. And she was like, but I know the God that I serve, and I'm not questioning him. So if he had to do what he needed to do, then he took my son, he took my son. And then I got the phone and started crying, and I was like, dang, I don't know if anybody, you see your son laying there on life support. His body's pretty much dead at this point, you know? But she was so in life, <coughs> uh, peace, and even they you know, Barry has sent today, whatever, and I called her later and I was like, oh, do you need some food? Like, do you guys need anything? And she goes, no, I just came downstairs from eating. I'm, I'm, I'm upstairs. I'm about to take a nap. And I was like, you know, because for me, I don't know, you know, but she's like, she's like, listen, I'm fine. I know the God that I serve. I'm not worried about it. And, I, and then that kind of gave me like a little peace. I'm still dealing with the emotional part of it, but like, that was peace because just knowing that she's like, God took my son. But it's not It's not that you're not going to feel it, right? It's yeah. not that... Shock. No, but it's not that you're not going to feel it. Because it's not that Christians are superhuman and you're not going right. to feel this pain. Because we, you're still going to feel it. But I think that God is so merciful that he allows us to look at life through a different perspective. That even if you're in pain, that even if you're... Even if everything around you is going downhill, there's something about seeking Jesus that puts a peace in your heart that you're immovable. Right. That, yeah, because people are like, oh, well, why are you so calm? And it's like, it's not that, you know, I, I feel it, but I know the God that I serve. Yeah. That's why Job, he, everything was taken away from him. And his wife even told him, curse your God. Curse him. But Job said it. I, can, I, I was born alone. I will die alone. God gives. God takes away. But be the name of the Lord glorified. So then the question really is, how do we know the difference between the counterfeit and God's truth? That's a question. That's a real question for you guys. How do you know the difference? How do you know when it's the enemy messing with your emotions. How do you know when it's God's word, God's voice, or the enemy's voice? Go ahead, Jules. Um, 
It's literally a gut check. <coughs> it's like, I'm put in a position where I'm questioning, and I'm like, how oh, does that feel right? But it's a gut check. And then when, you, when it's right, it's peaceful, you don't question it at all. Anybody else? Jare, you got something? ¿Cómo tú sabes cuando es Dios y cuando es el enemigo jugando juego contigo? ¿Cómo uno sabe la diferencia? How do you know the difference? He said that to the enemy you can always see his tail. Half truth and half lies. And that brings us to this, to his answer. How do we, how can we tell the difference? Is it aligned with God's truth? Go ahead, Jess. I was gonna say, um, knowing God's word, so that you can identify it when you are having those moments of where it's coming from, and learning the word is like, okay, I know where it's coming from. This is what I'm studying. Right. So, let's go to have truths. Can anybody tell me a point in the Bible where somebody was throwing half truths and somebody else had to hit them back with truth? Jesus, when he was walking in, in the wilderness. Uh huh. What happened? To the devil, and the devil said, "Well, if you jump, they look at look at the usher board. board. I'm <laughs> <laughs> no, that was actually one of my favorite. Because uh, what did he say? Where is it in the Bible? Uh, I think it's in a book of. It's in one of the New Testaments. Uh huh. Go ahead, keep going. Mark, Matthew, one of them. It's, it's in Matthew chapter Matthew. four. Okay. So I know it's in one of them, but it was it um it, when I read that and or actually when I listened to it, I was like, wow. So I had to play it back again, and I was like, that is so crazy how the enemy would tell you because he said jump, and didn't God say that he would like save you or he would have your angels lift you up? And I was like, oh look at the devil here! And then he said, um, and then he had went on to say like two other things, but I was like, wow. And then Jesus sent him back with, um, do not test your father. But that's, you see what, fine print, again, the enemy was using word. Yes. Yes, the enemy was, you know, I don't know if y'all ever noticed people that are, are straight from the pits of hell and they will call scripture at you. Right. Here's the problem. If we don't, if we don't know our word, we'll be like, well, well of course he's a believer. He shared a Bible verse with me. And it's like... <laughs> Bible under the arm, no. Yes. Yeah. We had, we had, this was back in 2017, 2016. 2017, 2018, uh, this chick came in. She was throwing scripture at me Friday Night Live, throwing scripture at me, throwing scripture at me. But I noticed she wouldn't say Jesus. So then I asked her a question, and I, said, and I asked her a question. She started stuttering. I said, Your mother God, because that's a religion called Mother God. And she goes, I, 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 I said, Your mother God. I said, you don't believe in Jesus. We, we, I said, you don't believe in Jesus. But she, everybody in the class was like, because everybody was like, oh, yes, yeah, she must be spiritual. Amen. She was throwing all these scriptures. It actually wasn't a her. It was a dude. It was a dude. And he was throwing all these scriptures. And then when I said Mother God, everybody was like, what the heck? What is Mother God? I said, those are the people you see at the Palisades Mall. They pull you to the side. And they want to jump, jump it, dump it down your throat. But here's the thing. The enemy knows his word that the, the religion is this and i'm not going to get too much into it but the religion is this they believe that if there's a father god there's a mother god and that the mother god can do everything that father god does and so that what they basically do is they they take this is how cults happen they take scripture and they begin to twist it to their own way but they throw so much scripture at you that people that don't know are like oh well yes this is this is christian this is good because it, it makes sense what they're saying but in one i forgot what verse they she threw or he threw and i said you're mother god i said you're a believer of mother god and as soon as i said it the guy's face turned red he didn't know what to do because he didn't think i would catch it but here's the thing guy uh, guys fine print um sometimes and and i'm gonna say this for me if you're as loud and as boisterous as me then you don't have, if you're talking all the time, you don't, have pay, you don't have time to pay attention or listen. And that's how you get caught. But if you're somebody like Ariel, who doesn't talk much, but is always observing, people who observe, observe. And then you can see, mm, something's off. So, so basically, what do we learn from this? That we have to slow down. There's a verse in the Bible that says, be slow to speak. 
Because if, you're, if you slow down and you pay attention, you can catch it that something is off. Right? I've had people, I know, I know of people that have had, I don't know if it was somebody here, that Jehovah's Witness came to the house and they were like, oh, come on in. And my mom has always said like, you know, don't don't even entertain it. Like in the beginning, right? With right. with the serpent. Like if you don't know enough, don't think that you're so strong enough because they can twist you and turn you out. Yeah, yeah. But that person was like, "Oh, you want to talk about the Bible? Oh, come on in." Because yeah. that person was like a Bible scholar, and by the time that that, that Jehovah's Witness ran out of the house so quick, because they were like, hey, "No, I don't want none of this. I don't want none of this." Um, another thing: How do we know the difference between counterfeiting God's truth besides aligning it with Scripture, right? Tested by the Spirit. 2 Corinthians 11, 14. Anybody, anybody have it? 2 Corinthians 11, 14. For no one that will save himself transform himself into an angel of light. What does it say? Say it again. And no one that will save himself transform himself into an angel of light. So it goes back to the same thing. Tested by the Spirit. That's why we need the, the gift of discernment. Because he looks the part. Because he can play the part. Remember, we've been talking about Christian atheists. Our ice, our, our gut check was, am I a counterfeit Christian? Do you know what I'm saying? Tested by the spirit. Sometimes, you know, so many people will be in the wrong and still think they're in the right. And there's a verse in the Bible, and Eddie told me this one time. It's the scariest verse in the Bible. He was like, is it true? I said, well, what verse is it? He was like, the one where it says, Depart from me that I don't know you. I said, oh, holy, that's absolutely true. Mm -hmm. Because how many times do we meet people that think that they think they're in right standing with the Lord and they're so far from Christ? So far, they're so blinded by their own sin. I'm not talking about non believers, I'm talking about believers that think, and the Bible says, be careful that you think you're firm lest you fall. Pride comes before the fall. Be careful. Um, I was having a conversation with Ariel. There was an individual, and every time you speak to this individual, the person always has to share all their accolades. Mm. Oh, I was in a Bible study. Oh, I was in a shelter helping men. Oh, I was... And it makes you wonder, when every time you have to talk to somebody, they always got to share all their accolades. And this person is a believer. I didn't even ask you what you did today. Why are you telling me you were in a shelter? I didn't ask you what you did today. Why are you telling me you was in a Bible study? What does that sound like to you? For my observant people in the room. Boasting. Prideful. Ariel, you said a word. It, you said something else. Uh, it was... Uh, what I said was overcompensating. They're overcompensating. When somebody always has to share all their accolades, then that's a sign of something else. Insecurity. And yet, this person, I would, have, I would have never thought that that would be one of their weaknesses, is insecurity. Because the person seems so secure to me. But here's the thing. When we think we're so secure in the word, we're so secure in our Christian walk, that's when we really got to do a gut check with the Lord. And say, Lord, let have the Spirit test me. That's why the Psalmist David said, search my heart. Because sometimes we're dealing with stuff, guys, that we don't even know we're dealing with. And we lie to ourselves. We yeah. We and you you sometimes you think, does that person really believe their lies? Well, if they telling you, it's because they really believe mm -hmm. it. Like if somebody is telling you something and you know they're lying and they're not even budging. They sell it and they buy it. They sell, they lie to themselves. They lie to their son so much that they don't even remember that they lie to themselves. They've convinced themselves of this. Have, 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 yes, like pathological lies, but to the point. But here's the thing. There's pathological lying Christians where we believe that we're so on the straight and narrow that we've fooled ourselves. But that's why we have to go back. Remember, gut check is not for me to tell Amy. No, gut check is for me to tell me. Am I, am I, um, am I a counterfeit Christian? Because a counterfeit Christian is you're walking the part, you're talking the part, but, you're, but your life doesn't match what you're, 
You're, you're, you know what I'm saying? You can walk the walk, but something is, it doesn't match. And again, nobody can judge that except for you. And the Holy Spirit, if, if we, as the Holy Spirit is so good that if we tell the Holy Spirit, Lord, am I doing something wrong? The Holy Spirit will tell you what you're doing wrong. We were having a conversation about somebody. We're like, I don't think that person realizes that they hurt other people's feelings. And we're like, no. Have you ever met somebody like that where they hurt your feelings and they keep walking? And it's just like, you just hurt my feelings. You don't even realize you hurt my feelings. <laughs> Everybody's laughing, but... And then they go, I'm sorry you felt that way, but they're not sorry. No, no, I'm sorry you felt that way. If I, offend, <laughs> if I offended you, no, you did offend me. Oh, well, then there must be something wrong with you. Well, what about when they start off with no offense, but... Oh, I had a girl, I used to work with a girl like that. Una Chinita, every time she, her name was Susan. And you don't need to edit this out. If Susan hears it, listen to it, Susan. She'd be like, Lucy, I'm, no offense, but... And I told her one day, Susan, if you tell me no offense, but one more time, because every time you say that to me, you're going to offend me. You hurt my feelings. But we're talking spiritually speaking, right? Let's ask the Holy Spirit tonight, Lord, if there's something I'm doing that I shouldn't be doing, and I'm not talking about nobody else, somebody to, no, I'm talking about because there's things that in us that God wants to take out, that God wants to bring us to another level and he can't, not until he gets rid of that. And maybe somebody, nobody's ever even told you about that fault, right? Quizá nadie te, di, no, nadie te ha dicho, no haga eso. Pero el Señor mismo te dice, no lo haga. No lo haga. And I'm going to share this. Ariel got this little microphone here, right? And you know how I edit pictures? Well, editing pictures is a lot easier than editing people's voices. Because if you got a double chin, I can remove the double chin. But if you said something... Once, how many of you know that once you say it, it's out already? Yeah. You can't take that back. So my brother Ariel, he had a class of two weeks ago. And he sent me the, the, video, the, the audio. And I said, no, Ariel, you got to edit that. You got to edit that. You got to edit that. And, and he was like, all right. And the Holy Spirit told me, you know, Lucindy, Ariel wouldn't have to do so much editing if you just washed your mouth. What? Yeah. Yeah, I, I know she had mom to tell you. I said, well, what? <laughs> God, I'm, I'm, I'm the teacher. And he was like, that's exactly why I'm saying it. You would give Ariel less work if you were more intentional with what you say and how you say it. And then I said, well, Lord, I, but he was like, this isn't a photo shoot. This is real life. You're actually speaking and people are listening. And yeah, sure, Ariel can delete whatever was said for the future hearers, but how about the people who already heard it? He was, and he told me, sit up, I'm not going to take you to another platform because if I put you on a platform in front of people, you can't, Ariel can't be there deleting old, never mind, she didn't mean to say that. <laughs> never mind, she didn't, she didn't mean to say that. You get what I'm saying? <laughs> All right, so. There's, there's an old saying that says, um, God gave us two ears and one mouth so we could listen twice as much as we speak. That part. What? Oh, Janet. My mom said you wanted to say something. Yeah. Oh, no, I was thinking about um, that you said we need to go check ourselves. Right? And, and I say this lightly, though. Like, we should also check the people we love. I was reading Samuel, right? And I was thinking Eli didn't correct his sons. And they got so bad. Or like, if he would have loved them, he would have checked them sooner. Right. Like, he would have spared their life. And I, and I say that like, God was very gentle with me when he should have been harsher with me. And I needed a reality check. But I could, like, you know, it's, you know, it's, when you love someone, you tell them. So if someone doesn't refuse to listen, then you step back. Right. right. Like, you should tell someone. But I think, I. You have to say we love, but I think that, and I've learned this from my mom. I asked her one time, she was going to have a conversation with somebody. I, I wanted her to address an issue with somebody. I, I needed her to address an issue. She said, if God gives me the green light, I'll address it. But if God does not give me the green light, I will not. Um, within the next few months, that person ended up coming up to my mom and opened that door. And she was able to. We spoke about this in Sunday school. 
right? Um, our sister Jasmine had somebody talking to her about witchcraft. She didn't want to judge the person, so she said nothing. But then the person said, I see demons in my house. At that point, that person opens up the door for her to be able to do what you're saying to do. You know what I'm saying? So I think we have to be wise. And it's also on the relationship. You know what I'm saying? Like, obviously, if Jennifer was to tell me something, I might be offended, right? Because of the relationship. But if Courtney was to tell me something, so you know what type of relationship you have with people. You know what I'm saying? If you have that relationship with the person, it's just like, hey, right, you need to pull it back. But I, I agree. And as, as parents, absolutely. I mean, I don't think we need permission for that. You need to tell your kids something. You need to tell them something. You do. It's your responsibility as a parent. It's a parent to strain the Sometimes sometimes the words that you use is not. Sometimes as a parent, we correct our child, but sometimes we are a little rough in ages for our kids. Instead of help them, we destroy them. Because sometimes the words that you say, you cannot take it back. They take your very deep. Well, you have to be wise. You have to be wise and you have to do it. Carefully how you say it because sometimes you say, Oh, but you're wrong, and you correct it, but you're not giving us the answer how to, how to guide how to fix it. Do you know, and that's at the key is you cannot create a person without giving an answer. But not everybody has that gift. We spoke yeah. about this a, a few weeks ago. Like some yeah. people just have a gift to be able to correct the love. Because some people, when they correct, it sounds so harsh. And, and, and you're right, sometimes it's about the relationship, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's about some people just want to play Holy Spirit Junior and take matters into their own hands and not be led by the Spirit and just speak and destroy. No, yeah. Put their foot in their mouth, and you have to be. If that's not your gift, yeah, I, I agree with that. that um, we had a pastor here at one point, and this dude, when he finished talking to you, you weren't sure if he disciplined you or. You weren't really sure. And you know who else has that? Pastor Julio. I mean, that dude had me sitting down and disciplined for a year. And I didn't even know I was in discipline. But he was he was so wise about it. And every time he saw me, he gave me a hug and smiled. And he's like, you, I don't have that gift. But God bless whoever does have that gift that is so has, is gentle. But then that brings us to the next thing. How do we discern counterfeit God's truth? We align with scripture. We test by going by the spirit. We spend time with God, which is what Jazz said. You spend time with God. The Bible says, my sheep know me. They know my voice. Um, how can you defend yourself against fraud if you don't know what's real? Um, and I was going to say this. Somebody who, and for example, my brother is a sneakerhead. He knows everything about Jordans. Now, somebody like me, somebody could probably sell me a pair of fake Jordans and I would wear them because I don't know the difference. Right? I haven't studied it enough. I, I just know they got the little the jumping guy, right? I only got two pairs of Jordans and I'm 40. He's insulted. He's insulted, but I know you can't walk outside when it's raining with Jordans. I know this. But all right. So how does and, and I studied this. How do how does the government know when it's fake or when it's real when it comes to money? They're not studying the fake. They study the real so much. They study the dollar and the feel of it and the numbers and the serial numbers so much that when it's real, when something comes fake, they automatically know. So how do we defend ourselves against the scheme of the enemy? Are we going to sit there and study the enemy? You, Johnny, you're going to sit there and be like, huh, I see you. Mm -hmm. Okay. No. No. You're going to get so deep into your word and know the word so much. That when somebody comes at you, you're like, mm, that doesn't align with what God says. Amen. Just like if somebody was to sh share my brother a pair of Jordans, he'd be like, those are fake because I know the Jordans from 1982 were cut with this, the color, the stitching, da 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 You know what I'm saying? Just like with the, the, Louis Vuitton, the Louis Vuitton bags. My sister loves the Louis Vuitton bags. You were to sell me a fake Louis Vuitton bag? I'd rock it because I don't know. My sister's like... Oh, no, I know. And I said, well, how do you know? She was like, girl, I studied the real one. The stitching is this color. And I said, who got time for that? You know who got time for that? Somebody who likes Louis Vuitton bags. So how do we defend ourselves against the schemes of the enemy? How do you know when somebody's playing you? How do you know when something is not from the Lord? How do you know when to step back? How do you know if it's the enemy trying to pull you away and have that soul be lost? 
Or if it's God telling you, no, you need to step away, get into your word. Because when we get into our word, we become hypersensitive to the Holy Spirit's voice. And all of a sudden, we can't unsee it. We can't unhear it. Example, certain TV shows. So how do we defend ourselves? I have many times in prayer heard the voice of the devil instead of the voice of Jesus. Ooh. I have heard, I have had sway words come into my mind and thoughts that are not from the Lord. And I think that when I pray, when I pray that everything told to me is true, then I better be careful. Satan can pose as the ultimate imposter and ruin the original. If you do not know the voice of the shepherd, you're in deep trouble. One chick told me yesterday. Y me lo dijo en español. Ella dijo, cuando yo estoy guiando y mi esposo comienza a pelear conmigo, a mí me dan una gana de abrir la puerta y tirarme. And she go, and I said, and she goes, ¿tú sabes qué? Que yo sé que es el enemigo. But if she didn't know that she would think that something is wrong with her. And you know what she told me? She goes, yo te lo estoy diciendo a ti porque yo sé que tú me entiendes. That's what the enemy does. He, he, he gets into our head and he, he disguises himself, matters himself, but as us. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Where it's not, that's one of our I'm, thoughts. I'm going to use the example for jazz. It's not, oh, I, the devil, am telling you to give Brian an attitude today because of this. He's not going to say, I, the devil. He's going to say, I, Jasmine, am mad at Brian, so I'm going to do this to him. And the thought will come into your mind. You'll be like, oh, you're right. I am mad at, at Brian. And it wasn't even you who put that thought in your mind. But he's so slick that he whispers into your ear. And if you're not paying attention, all of a sudden you're in a bad mood with Brian. And Brian didn't even do nothing to you. You see what I'm talking about? He disguises himself as us. He makes us. We, any of y'all you ever get some crazy thoughts and you're like, mm, I can't even share those crazy thoughts. Please don't. Right, I have one lady here, and you don't need to edit this out either. One lady here, she was like, I'm gonna kill my brother. I'm gonna kill him. I was thinking of how to do it. Yo, it got so hot in that room that day. My cousin was here for the first time. He was like, I'm never coming back to Friday Night Live. Those thoughts, listen, those thoughts were not coming from her. That was the enemy disguising himself and making her believe that those thoughts are coming from her. When we get thoughts like that, guys, that's not us. That's not us. That's the enemy getting into our head, but he's not going to tell you, hi, Jasmine, it's me, the devil. Let me put some thoughts into your head. No, he's going to say, hi, Jasmine, it's Jasmine. Let me put some thoughts into your head. You know what I'm saying? So how do you fight yourself against that? Remember that the enemy uses a little bit of truth. So then, let's say you were thinking that. Now, I'm just using you guys as an example. The truth was that Brian that day didn't make you breakfast like he makes you breakfast every morning. And he said he was going to put gas in the car. And when you went to the car, the gas was on E. And he left to work and didn't give you a kiss. Let's just say. So now the enemy's like, well, let's, let's think about everything that Brian did today. You should be mad. Because if he was a better man, he would have put gas in your car. He would have made you breakfast and he would have given you a kiss. You see what I'm saying? He uses a little bit of truth and twists it and makes it bigger and then justifies why we should act like this? The devil is a liar. He came to kill, steal, and destroy. Our, our weapons of warfare are not against each other, guys. Our weapons of warfare are against the devil himself and principalities of darkness. And if we're not watching or we have open doors, we can be used by the enemy to trip anybody up. Mm -hmm. Oh, but I'm a believer. The enemy can't use me. Well, if you're not in right standing, the enemy will use you. It's not can he. It's he will. He will. And if you, if you suffer from anger, let's say, and you're having an anger fit, there's an open door. He's going he's gonna to have a field day with you. Do you guys get what I'm saying? How do you fight against counterfeit and truth? Get into your word. Where the Bible says in John chapter 10, verse 3, 5, the watchman opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought all who, who all his own, he goes ahead of them and his sheep follow because they know 
his voice. They will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do recognize a stranger's voice. How many of the mothers, you could be in Target, and if you say, baby, your kid is like, I'm coming. Why? Because baby knows mommy's voice. There could be a bunch of mommies in the room, but when you say, Logan, he's like, that's my mom. Or when Logan says, mommy, you're like, that's my son. But a lot of us don't get into our words. So when the enemy's like, Jared, you're like, yes, Lord. And it's like, no, that's the enemy calling you. Don't open the door. Okay, but think about it. How do we uh, renew our minds every morning and take thoughts captive? Think about what you're thinking about. What are you thinking about? Why am I getting these thoughts? But then you have to think, what am I listening to? What am I watching? Do you understand? Because we think about what we see. We think about what we hear. If you're listening to Eminem, you're not going to be thinking about Jesus and his goodness. Do you know what I'm saying? If you're, if you're listening to, I, I don't know what kids listen to these days. I was going to say Taylor Swift, but the, you don't look like a Taylor Swift kind of girl. Um, Remy. No, that's too old, right? Who's this girl? The one with the orange hair. Ice spice? Ice, let's say ice spice. I don't know. But let's say you're listening. Well, whatever. I don't know what people listen to these days. Let, if you're listening to, to, what's the guy? Oh, my God. I lost my train of thought. The, the pop smoke. There we go. If you're listening to pop smoke. And I, all I know is that he's dead. <laughs> but if you're listening to pop smoke, it's not going to put you in the mood to worship. If you're watching Game of Thrones, it's not going to put you in the mood to worship. It's going to make you want, you're going to feed your flesh. You know what I'm saying? So how do we control our thoughts? Control what you see and what you hear and what you entertain. You know what I'm saying? Does that make sense? It's funny that you say that. I, I, was, at, I was at the gas station. I, I work at night, so I was coming out of work. And I listened to Hot 97 in the morning for the morning show that they have. They make me laugh. So a song comes on and the, and the, the rhythm is really catchy. But I learned a long time ago, don't just go by the rhythm of the song, listen to what they're saying. Yeah. So as I'm pumping gas and I turn it off, I, I, I listen, I'm listening to the song, I'm like, what did she just say? And I have to listen to it again. And the girl is literally talking about killing the guy's girlfriend. Right. And but making it like, like, like a nice R&B song. And I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? Right <laughs> <laughs> and the girl is literally talking about, yeah, I'm gonna go kill his girlfriend and, and whatever. And, and I'm like, and, 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 and I, for the idea that they have on radio? This is, a, I, I don't know, it's a girl singing. It's song. actually a really nice rhythm song. It really it's a really is. catchy song. Yeah. I don't even, I don't want you guys to listen to it because if you listen to it, you're gonna be humming to it. But it's got a nice rhythm. You guys probably know what it is. I mean, I, I hear it and I'm gonna hear it. I have one last thing here, and it says, by spending time with God in prayer, reading his word, and having fellowship with other believers, which is what Jazz said in her prayer, you will be able to know the voice of Jesus. Then the imposter will, comes calling, you, know, you will know. If you think today is not evil, think again. Satan will try to do whatever he can, not just to hurt you, but destroy you. Are you ready to stand firm, and do you even know where your enemy is coming from? Don't be ignorant of any more of the schemes of the devil, the ultimate imposter and counterfeiter of the faith. He imitates, so we, he will make us believe wait, that we're good Christians. He's an imitator. So basically, what do you get out of this class? What you should get out of this class? That we need to be hypervigilant. That we need to be watching at all times. That we need to pay attention to. Think about what you're thinking about. Think about what you're listening to. Think about what you're watching. And know that every thought, uh, Rich Lean, that comes into your mind isn't from you. The enemy is a liar. You know what I'm saying? And also remember that your fight isn't against your neighbor, your mom, your brother, your kid, your, your nephew, your sister, whatever. Your fight is against the enemy, and he will use anything. He is no respecter of persons. He will use anything, anyone to throw you off. Any, it, it, and usually, Rich Lean, unfortunately, is the people we love. Usually. <laughs> Most of the time. Because he's not going to use me to hurt you because you and I were not that close. All you got to do is block me and you're done. But he will use somebody that you love dearly. And if, if you're not paying attention, you start hating somebody that you're supposed to love. 
or you know what I'm saying? So we have to pay attention. Next week, we have three speakers. Um, we have testimony night next week. We'll be downstairs. Please don't miss it. Because ain't nothing better than testimony. You know why? Why is there nothing better than testimony? Anybody? Ain't nobody can argue your testimony. It's yours. You can argue whatever you want, but you can't argue somebody's testimony. That is their experience. I can't argue telling you, Cynthia, no, you didn't feel that. No, God didn't tell you that. Well, no, God did tell you that because that's what you felt. So there's evidence. Yes. So we have three lovely speakers, all ladies, by the way. No offense, guys, but we, wow, we need y'all to step it up. Um, that's next week at 8 o'clock. And also next week is Iverson's birthday. He's turning 18. So we don't want to miss it. And we're going to have cake again next week because it's your birthday. And ain't nobody going to die in this room. All right, to pray us out, we're going to have our brother Jared. Wow. Why? Why not? Why not? Holy Ghost filled, sanctified. And if I'm yours, I'm being.